I love the Lord, not like I should, but the way I know how. Amen. Is there any other announcements, anything I've missed this morning at all? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, they will be? Okay. So they can take them for this Sunday and next Sunday. Okay. I hope everybody heard that. I can barely hear I'm about half deaf, but I think she said next Sunday's a deadline to turn in the names on the food baskets. Anything else this morning? Yes, brother. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. When do y'all leave, brother Tom? Next Saturday. So you pray for them while they go to Haiti. Amen. All right, if that's everything, open your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. Notice that singular revelation. It's not revelations, plural, because it is the revelation. You read chapter number one, verse number one of Jesus Christ. It's not of John, but it's of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter two and verse number one. The word of God said unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. But notice verse number four, Nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Our Father, we're so thankful this morning for this infallible book. And it's a book that we can stand on, that does not waver. And as the Sunday school teacher said this morning, this book is not sinking sand, but it is a sure foundation. Yes. It is an anchor for our soul. And what it says we can believe. and We can stand on it and know that it never wavers nor never fails. And our Father, if anything fails, it's us. And we need your help today. And I ask you, Lord, this morning to move by the power of your Holy Spirit. Move in conviction save sinners, and I pray, Father, that you'd touch our hearts, the hearts of believers, and set them on fire for Jesus again, and we ask it by faith, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Revelation chapter number 2 is the beginning of the letters that Jesus told John to write to the seven churches that were in Asia. And the five of those churches, and Ephesus including one of them, Jesus said, I have somewhat against thee. And I know that in the second church, the church at Smyrna, they were a church that suffered much affliction. And he said of that church that there were some in the church that said they were Jews and were not, and 
Jesus called that blasphemy, but still he didn't say that I have something against you. But in the other five, he did. And Ephesus being one of them. And I want to help this morning by the grace of God. I want to speak to you this morning on Ephesus. The Apostle Paul on a missionary journey in the book of Acts chapter number 19 came to a little city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a city that was steeped in idolatry. They worshiped the goddess Diana. They had a huge synagogue or a temple that was made unto Diana. And they had uh, silversmiths that worked daily and men that labored daily. That's how they earned their income, just making little idols to the goddess Diana to worship her. The apostle Paul came on his missionary journey to Ephesus and he began to preach the word of God. He preached on the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached his death, his burial, and the resurrection of the Son of God. And he preached unto that city that there be no gods made with hands. And by the way, there is only one God and one God to be worshiped. And that God is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is none other. That's no compromising grounds whatsoever. I've had people say, you're too narrow-minded, said, I don't believe that way. I believe that there's many ways to get to the one God. There's only one way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father but by me. That is, by Jesus Christ. You've got to say that today because people will think you're talking about the preacher. I'm not the way. I'm the, I'm the mistake that's in the way. Jesus is the only way. I hope you can understand what I just said. In any language, Jesus is the only way to God's heaven, period. And Paul the apostle began to preach that in that city. I mean, it tore them all to pieces. It, it upset them. But God, the Bible said in chapter number 19, the book of Acts, that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. They tore little pieces of cloth and handkerchiefs off of Paul's uh, garments and laid them up on the sick fold, and the sick folk were made whole. The devils departed, demons fled. And it tore the town up so much that many of them that got saved by the grace of God that practiced the magical arts of, uh, of soothsaying and uh, sorcery that they gathered all their books together and gave revival and piled them up and burned every one of them. I'm going to tell you, if you truly get saved by the grace of God, there'll be a change in your life completely. I'm talking about a new man in Christ Jesus. They brought their books and, and, and the, the, the men of the city that lived by making the shrines under dying of the goddess. They got worried about their wages. They tried to make it a religious matter and said that they're defiling the temple and saying bad things about Diana. That's not what they were worried about. They were worried about their billfolds. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Because that's the first thing they talked about. Said, we're in peril of our earnings. This is how we make our living. And there's many that's turning away. And we're losing our income because of the message of this man. And there was a great uproar, the Bible said. And they began to cry out among them. And listen, when crowds get together, people follow other people. You ought to have a mind of your own. Just because so-and-so jumps off a bridge don't mean you need to jump off of it too. 
Some of them begin to cry. Great is the goddess of Diana. And then others panned in with them began to cry the same thing before you know it. The whole town was in confusion about it. Oh, let me tell you something. The apostle Paul, he taught that church at Ephesus. The Bible said this, that he taught for the space of three months in the synagogue and there was people that were hardened against the message and that's what the gospel will do it'll either break your heart or harden your heart it'll either bring you to Christ or drive you away and so he separated the disciples is what the Bible said Paul did and for a space of two years he rooted and grounded them in the school in the word of the living God. He taught them the love of Christ. He taught them what it meant to believe the Bible and to believe what Jesus said. He taught them about faith and he taught them and rooted and grounded them in the love of Christ. I want to jump off just a little bit here a second and Spring off, I already had it marked, Brother Tony. I don't care. I already had it marked in my Bible in the book of Ephesians chapter number 2. No, I'm telling you, this book's for everybody. He taught this to the church at Ephesus. He said, and you hath he quickened. <laughs> you all were dead in your idols making shrines under the goddess Diana. You were captive in your sins. You were in bondage to it. I got to say this. The Lord knows how to bring people your way at the right time. I was on the job this past week and everybody had left but me and one other young man. And I got to talking to this young man and I was talking to him about the Lord and he stopped and looked up and said, I got to tell you something. He said, I don't know if I can get through this without crying. And I thought, oh boy, this is going to be good. He said, eight years ago, he said, I was a drug addict. And he said, I was in bondage. I was captive. I was in chains. I couldn't get away from it. I knew in my mind that I needed to get away from it. But said one Sunday I come to the church and said the word of God was being preached and said I went forward and eight years ago he said I've been set free ever since. Eight years he's been out of bondage. That's exactly what Paul's trying to tell the Ephesians. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. And said, all of us had our conversation in that. All have sinned and come show the glory of God. There's none of you that's perfect this morning. All of us have failed. And he said this in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And that sounds very dismal. But he started that and said, You hath he quickened. And that word means he's made alive. I've probably said this before, but I'll say it again. My father-in-law pastored a little country church out in Clinton. And he said that word quicken means to make alive. And a bunch of the deacons come to him and argued with him and said that don't mean that at all. Well, I beg to differ with you. That word means that he has made you alive. You were dead. You were blinded by the God of this world. 
You could not see. And if you're lost this morning, you cannot see, nor can you understand until the almighty God turns the light on inside your soul. Amen. said, you have to be quickened. And then he said this, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. <laughs> Brother Tony, I like what you said this morning. He loves us. Oh, he loves us. Listen, only God knew what the testimony of that young man this past week would do for my soul. We go through dry times in our Christian life. We go through waste howling wildernesses. And he said, I don't know if I can even finish this without crying. And we stood there and wept together because he was set free. You said, preacher, why did you weep? Because I understood. Because I was there too. When he came to me, bless his name. Glory to God. Sticking needles in my arms, snorting dope up my nose, smoking dope from the time I wake up till I went to bed drinking and anything else you want to name in between. And in my mind, I kept saying, I need to get away from this. I need to stop it. And no power within me could ever break that right. until I met the one. Amen. Glory to God that can set the captain free. Amen. I was bound in chains and fetters. The vision of my life was to stay dope to the day I died. But I'm glad, thank God, bless his name, that he stopped me in the middle of my tracks. And he came to me. A poor, lost, miserable, wretched sinner. A nobody or nothing. Some of you this morning think you've got friends in this world. You got friends till the dope's gone. You got friends till the money's gone. Well, did you hear old Lee's back in jail again? Go down to the clinic down there. I hope some of y'all ain't got none of it. But it's a weekly thing to go down and get the pipe stuck in my arm. To get blood drawn, draw plasma so they could donate that to people that needed it. I've gone down there high as a kite and inject my blood pressure and it'd be out the roof and they'd say go back here and lay down in a chair and rest a little while and once in a while they'd check it and when it got right they'd rush me in there pump it out and ship me out the door yeah. blowed completely out of my mind I'm telling you I was in bondage to it yeah. I was in prison. And the children at Ephesus, they were in a prison worshiping a God that was no God. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Oh, he really does care. He really does. Bless his name, he cares. Amen. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. There it is, Father. Yeah. We're saved by the grace of God. I'm going to tell you something else about the grace of God. We're kept by the grace of God, too. <laughs> well, if it's left up to me, Brother Miller, I'd been a long time ago. I 
I know every once in a while your boat tilts. You may not act like it, you know. You're so polished and so perfect, you know. Everything about you is just so righteous and you just smell so good. <laughs> yeah, that's what the church at Laodicea thought too. And Jesus said, you're wretched and miserable, blind and poor and naked. So you don't have need of nothing is what you think. I'm going to tell you something. I got up this morning, rolled out of my bed. I know that God gave me the breath to do that. And I said, God, you gave me the ability to take one step after another. You gave me the ability to open my eyes to allow the light to shine in there to that optic nerve to shoot back out and be able to read the word of God. I'm telling you, we serve a great big God. Amen. Paul wanted them to remember something, boy. It's God that's quickened you. It's Jesus. God loved you and he saved you by his grace and he saved you through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, they labored. That's what our text said. And I'm just going to dwell briefly on this. They labored. They worked hard. They, they, they had their doctrines. They had it all fine. They bared burdens, they, they worked everything out, but yet they lacked something and evidently, not just evidently, it was the most important part. And he said, you left your first love. You've left your first love. And I read that, I thought about, I thought about Psalms chapter number 40. Where David wrote that song, he said that he waited patiently on the Lord. And he said he cried unto the Lord with a loud voice. And said that he wretched down and picked me up also out of an horrible pit. And out of the miry clay is what he said. And I went over and studied that. That pit would be just like you'd take a great big old bit and just drill a straight hole down into the ground. No limbs, no branches, no nothing but just slick mud all the way down as far as it go. And then just drop you down in the hole. I'm telling you, no way out. You can't get out of there. It's an impossibility. As a matter of fact, David said he picked me up out of the miry clay. I know some of y'all that's in construction can appreciate this because I, I know what it is. And, of course, if you ever played on a, on a creek bank when you was a kid, singing in the mirrors or, uh, or, or trying to catch some li spring lizards or crawdads or something, you can step off the side of that bank or down in concrete with your boots on and you can get in that thick stuff and it's miry and you can't hardly with everything you got pull your foot out. I've done it many a time and lost a tennis shoe or a boot down in the mud. I mean, that's what miry clay is. You can't get yourself out of it. And yet David said he picked me up out of it. And you know what he did? He said he set my foot up on a rock. Amen. Said he established my goings. And something else he done. Said he put a song in my heart. And I'm going to tell y'all something. It's a bad day in the life of a Christian when we lose our song. That's our joy. That's walking away from our first love. We lose our song. You know what Israel done? I'm going to try to hurry. Israel... You read in Exodus chapter number 12, they were redeemed by the blood. They came out of the land of Egypt, and boy, I'm telling you, they were so excited by that, and, and uh, they looked behind them, and here come the enemy behind them, and God said to Moses, said, hold your rod out, and the part of the Red Sea, and Israel walked across on dry ground. 
And they stood and watched Pharaoh and his army come across. About the time they got in the middle of the sea, God knocked the props off. And the chariots that said he knocked the wheels off of them. And then more horses had to pull the carriages and them dragging the ground. And Israel stood back and watched Pharaoh and all his army drowned in the sea. And you know what the first thing they done? They wrote a song about it. David said many times over and over in the Psalms, he wrote song after song. He said to enter into his courts with praise and thanksgiving and songs. To the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter number 5, about verse number 18, Paul said to this church, Be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's a sad day when our song's gone. It's when we've lost that intimate, personal. I love the way Brother Tony put that in Sunday school this morning. It's different for each one of us. It's an intimate relationship it's a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they could say, I, I remember years ago we used to sing a song here at the church, the title, I Love Him. Mm -hmm. Brother Bill Wright would turn that around and said, when we come to that course, said, I want you to make it personal and just cup your hands over your mouth and look up to heaven and say, I love you. Yeah. And that's what we can do. I love you. That was important to Jesus. He pointed out every one of their labors and all that they'd been strong in. And the one that you'd think could be the least expected was you left your first love. I said, Preacher, that just don't seem to be that important. Oh, it's to Jesus, it's the utmost. It's number one. I done rehearsed mine. And I hope that while I was preaching that in your heart, the Holy Ghost, if you're saved by the grace of God, rehearsed that moment with you. In the first six months or a year, you walked in the clouds. And for the first time, you knew what love really was. And you was experiencing a brand new life. I hope you can remember that. And Jesus said this, and I'm closing. He said, if you leave your first love, he said, you've fallen. He said, you've fallen. That means that you've dropped away. You're off course. You're completely off course. You've taken the wrong road. You've fallen away, and you come to the place that things begin to feel like they don't take any effect on you. I mean, I can sit in church and fall asleep with the best of them. That's when it's not taking effect with you. I know these diseases and these problems, and I don't never mock anybody over that. I'm not sitting where they're at. My wife, if she don't take a medicine, and boy, I want her to take it real bad. <laughs> Especially if I'm riding with her, she'll fall asleep behind the wheel. <laughs> and if I'm riding, I want her to be sure. I ask her, have you taken your stay awake medicine? <laughs> But you've fallen. You veered off the wrong path. You come to the place that, well, it's the same old message again. Ho oh, hum. I know, I've seen it. And he know, he, boy, they want me to be sure and see. 
It's quitting time. I'm going to say this because I was embarrassed really before God. I appreciate the message Brother Roger White preached Wednesday night, Brother, I really do. I appreciate the messages that's being preached here in the last few months because just a little here and there, a little here and there, the Lord's been dealing with my heart. I walked in there last night. I've got this great big old large print because I'm about half blind now. I've studied this. I've got it marked up. But I thought, boy, I'm going to run back in there and see what I studied out on that on my first preaching Bible. Little old small burgundy back King James Schofield Bible. And opened it up, Brother Tony, and practically every page, and that was falling out. They were scattering all over the place. I had to keep gathering up, putting them. The edges of the pages were rolled back. The back was broke apart. The entire back leather had come apart from that Bible. And I thought, oh, Lord God, I'm sitting here embarrassed before you. I'm ashamed. Brother Roger mentioned Wednesday night about studying the Bible and reading the Bible. Yeah. Breaking the bread of life. And all I can say is, Lord, I'm embarrassed in front of you. I don't study like I should. Come on, nod your little head. You know you don't either. That's why it's got quiet. <laughs> we get preoccupied. And the Lord said this, said, you've fallen. You've strayed off the wrong path because you've left the very first thing. You can have your doctrines, cross your T's, dot your I's, be as legalistic, which stinks to me. <laughs> Don't get legalistic around me. That nauseates me. I'm going to tell you, be honest, it's been, from the beginning, it's been the grace of God. <laughs> but you can be perfect in your doctrine and still be fallen in your heart. I'm telling you the truth. You can sit on the front bench and pay for the dollar and a half seats instead of the quarter seats in the back. And your heart be a long ways from God. The choir can get tuned in to God. The preacher, the Sunday school teacher, somebody stand up and start testifying they're tuned in to God and you're sitting there just stone faced. I wonder what's got into them this week. We need to come back to our first love. Let's bow our heads this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God sees this morning every single heart. He sees my heart. He sees your heart. There's nothing hid from the eyes of God. He knows us through and through. Search your heart. I wonder this morning, is there anybody in this building anywhere who would say, Preacher, I don't even know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. I don't know him. And I'd like to just slip my hand up quick and put it right back down and ask the church to pray for me that I'd get saved. God bless your heart. Somebody else said, Preacher, I'm not saved. I'm not saved. I'm not saved. If I died today, I'd, I'd go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Pray for me. Pray for me. Anybody like that at all? All right. Those of you this morning that say, by the grace of God, I don't even have to ask you to raise your hand because you know in your heart 
The Holy Ghost has already pricked you and spoke to you. We're going to pray. Our Father, I pray for the precious hand that went up and said, I need to get saved. I pray Holy Ghost conviction. I pray for the enlightenment of the Word of God, enlightenment of the Holy Ghost to draw them to Christ. And Heavenly Father, I pray for your children all across this building. They know in their hearts that they have fallen away They've left their first love. Lord, that you have a controversy with them against that. And all about that, Lord, you want us to love you. You said to love the Lord thy God with part. No, you said with all of thine heart, all of thy mind, and all of thy soul. Oh, God, I pray that you'd deal with hearts and have your will your way this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.